when Dave invited me down here, he, was, he asked if I would uh, do a sort of autobiographical talk or something. And I, um, I didn't really think that that would be the right message uh, for this crowd, or not for this crowd, but in general. I do a lot of, I do a lot of work in, uh, I used to do a lot of work in the telecom space, and I used to do graphics and game programming and a bunch of stuff. And then the dot-com crash hit, and I couldn't get a job. So I went back to college and collected a bunch of degrees. Um, I currently work for McGraw-Hill Financial. We, I build tools for quants and traders. And uh, we use an awful lot of Haskell. I think I juggle something like a, I have a, a, probably about 180 repos on GitHub and four or 500, or 350, 400 collaborators somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and I, I pretty much committed to, to making sort of Haskell the place that I wanted to um, contribute to open source about eight years ago. Um, the main thing I'm probably known for is I do a lot of work on these things in the functional programming community uh, called Lenses, which is really all about sort of dealing with um, when you don't have mutation, how do you replace getters and setters? And I really was privileged to, to get that chance to go back to college uh, later on in my career. And I'm absolutely terrified of losing the things that I was able to pick up when I, got, when I went back. I mean, how many people here have forgotten calculus? All right, so um, most. <laughs> Um, and, and, and again, this isn't really an autobiographical talk. I, uh, I set a personal challenge uh, for myself um, to try and give a talk about a bunch of mathematicians to a bunch of people who um, are probably afraid of math. So um, to, to tie back to um, Martin and Todd's keynote the first day, um, how many people here know who Richard Feynman was? All right. So uh, Feynman was a, um, a physicist. He did a lot of work on quantum electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics, all sorts of crazy things, invented those little funny little Feynman diagram things down there in the corner. Um, but later on in his career, he went back and did a lot of work on things like uh, investigating the Challenger disaster um, and was sort of very well known for uh, um, uh, being a very clever fellow. And um, but there we go. Uh, one of the things that... Uh, he was sort of well known for was Feynman's algorithm. And Feynman's algorithm uh, consists effectively of uh, writing down the problem, thinking really hard, and writing down the solution. <laughs> and it was, it was a great algorithm when we had Feynman to run it on. Um, I, I can attest to a, a, a similar uh, sage. Write down the problem, profit. And the problem with Cartman's algorithm is that it can't be taught. Uh, and Feynman says the same problem. I can't, I can't make a Feynman. I can't just, uh, I, can, I can run out and I can spot one in the wild. Uh, but they're very hard to, uh, to craft from whole cloth. Um, and... Um, to that extent, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about what is the cost of the wrong solution. And what I mean by that is uh, uh, John Carmack gave a talk at, at QuakeCon, well, the keynote at QuakeCon. He always gives the keynote at QuakeCon. Um, and in it, one of the things he had mentioned was that uh, most developers are really bad at figuring out the total cost of whatever hacks they put in place. Um, and the question that I would pose to you is what is the cost of implementing the wrong solution? What is the cost of not knowing that there is a better solution? And what is the cost of that integrated over your entire career? And I'm absolutely terrified of doing, uh, of, the, of these problems. So, I mean, again, what is the cost of using the wrong solution over your entire career? And it's, it's, a, it's a cost that we have um, an unfortunate sort of self-censorship bias. We, we don't know what we don't know. And so we can't really know the cost of, oh, well, I'm going to go implement that using this, and, oh, there's a much better solution over the hill, but I never saw it. So I'm going to, uh, completely without hubris, tackle the topic of how to be a genius.
yes. Um, so this is, this is not, not my um, uh, vocabulary here. This was actually uh, a, another random topic that was introduced by Feynman. He had a spiel, there's him playing his bungus, um, where he would talk about, hold on to a bunch of problems that you have, whatever they are. Just keep a bunch of pet problems in your head. And whenever you come across a new tip, trick, technique, solution, what have you, uh, try it out against every one of your problems, and then go home, when well, you go home at night, just basically try them all out, and then come in the to work in the morning, and then if, if you got a hit last night, tell everybody. And uh, they'll go, well, uh, how did he do it? He must be a genius. Um, but, but I do a, a form of math called category theory. Um, turns out to be a great way to talk about functional programming. Um, and in category theory, we have these objects and arrows lying around. And um, one of the things that's true in category theory is that if I have any category with whatever sort of arrangement that I have, I can always take any statement that I can write down and I can flip it around and make an opposite statement that also is true. So what is the dual of Feynman's approach to how to be a genius? How can I turn around his statement and make another statement that happens to be true? So if we take his statement, his problem statement, we can flip the role of problems and solutions. If you hold on to a bunch of solutions in your mind and someone comes to you with a problem, you can try it out against every one of your solutions. And if it successfully hits, you're a consultant. <laughs> so by that note, I would say that a consultant is a co-genius. They are a genius in the opposite category. They are the exact opposite of a genius. <laughs> yeah. um, which brings me to another topic, um, or actually the same topic, sort of refined. And I want to talk about sort of searching through the space of problems and solutions that we have available to us. Okay? Because one of, you know, because if, if you know, pairing, pro if, if I'm looking at things from the perspective of, hey, I'm um, frantically searching around trying to solve something. <laughs> you know, I, I'm in industry, I've got, a, I've got a job, and they want me to solve this thing. Um, I've got to come up with a solution. How do I do it? I've got to come up with it right now. I don't have any time to look around. If I've always got my head in that space, it's very hard to get a chance to sort of look up and see where we're going. And um, we can kind of play around with this from the perspective of, uh, uh, of just AI, uh, of, of searching through a space. If, you're, if you try to do like a little agent-based AI, one of the things that we learn is that it's, it's beneficial if you, if you have to search from one end of the problem space to the other, um, you'll often kind of flounder in the space. On the other hand, if you're searching from the other end back, you, you'll still flounder. You, 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 you have a big space to search through. But if you can simultaneously search from both ends, you can meet up in the middle. You can cut the exponent in the search space, the power, how big of a space you have to walk through. And eventually you'll get some of these tendrils to start connecting on either, on either side. Um, and you'll be able to make that jump in the middle. And so, to that end, you can think of it that developers and researchers are really, by the, the nature of our industry, forced into a very suboptimal search strategy. A developer has a problem. He's being, he or she is being paid to solve a problem. If they don't solve that problem, they probably need a new, they're probably going to go, need to get a new job. Uh, on the other hand, you have researchers who are often, they have a solution, and they're fishing around for someone who wants that solution or needs that solution for their problem. Uh, so that they can get grant money or what have you. Uh, so it seems to me that, for the most part, folks in our industry are stuck in this sort of ro in roles which necessarily mandate that they spend all their time on these suboptimal search strategies. Um, and I don't have a good solution here, but this is one of the things that sort of keeps me in uh, trying to find these sort of half-researchy sort of roles, is because it lets me try to optimize for the number of problems I can pair with solutions rather than for my suitability to solve any particular problem. So that brings me to this notion of how to be a genius consultant. Um, so we've already established that if you could search from both ends, you can meet in the middle. So I would argue 
that perhaps a better search strategy might be to hold on to, say, half a dozen problems and half a dozen solutions. Um, start, whenever you get a new solution, try all your problems. When you get a new problem, try all your solutions. What you've done is you've optimized for your ability to solve problems, just not any particular one. Um, and if you look through my projects and the things that I maintain, this is something that I've, I've very much tried to live. Um, I don't know um, how effectively I can attest to um, it working, but I can say um, that it gives me an interesting supply of uh, problem domains to work on. And, and this isn't to say that you should just, you know, say, oh, I'm doing research today <laughs> and, uh, and not get anything done. Uh, I, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I just want to be clear. Um, so to that end, when I was first exposed to Feynman's algorithm, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to do, or I, want, I wanted to explore, I said, well, well, if holding on to a dozen problems is good, then holding on to like 400 would be awesome. The, the problem is how do you fit it all in? How do you remember all the things that you learn, right? Because we all forget. Uh, you know, we've all had that problem of we study, we cram, we cram for the test, and then a month later we have no idea what the heck it was that we learned. And uh, uh, some folks did a study back in 1885, and they showed that memory has this sort of exponential decay, which means that you're going to forget almost everything you know, which is absolutely terrifying to me. Um, it seems a, it's a fairly bleak message to take away here. It's that you, you, just, you just spend all this time learning it, and it's gone. Um, fortunately, it doesn't have to be just that. There's, a, there's some uh, research we can borrow from the, the world of cognitive science that says that the, uh, the best time to review something is right before you'd forget it, which is unfortunately not really actionable intelligence. Um, but we can do, what we can do, is we can say that every time you revisit a memory, you make it stronger. Every time you get a chance to go back to a topic or, or redo a thing, you get to, um, uh, that sort of decay becomes slower. So if you're trying to maximize your retention for the long, long haul, and, and, and let's be honest, your career is going to be a lot longer than you think. I personally thought I was going to be retired by 25. Um, I, I made and lost an awful lot of money in that. Um, somewhat startup averse at this point. Anyways, so every time you, if you um, have a chance to revisit a topic, if you can sort of revisit it on a sort of doubling cube basis, that would, you know, if you touch it now, touch it in a couple of months, touch it four months after that, eight months after that, et cetera. It, just keep, keep revisiting things that you've learned. Don't go, oh, I know that. Right? Because in... Effectively, you know, brain cells are constantly dying. You have seven years or so. In seven years, every brain cell that you have is, is completely replaced with a new one. All you have is the random synapse, synapses that you had firing in the night uh, while you sleep, trying to copy as much information as they can to another thing. And every time you copy something, there's a, there, it's, something is lost or rebuilt or reinforced or, or changed. So... You know, if, if, if you learned calculus seven years ago and you haven't used it since, you have memories of having been good at calculus. <laughs> um, or dreams of having been good at calculus. Um, and uh, there's another technique that comes up, and this also goes back to that notion of, 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 of search and proof search as we can kind of wander around through these spaces. Um, the idea of iterative deepening comes up in AI. So, uh, I know a little bit about a lot of things. And uh, if I'm confronted with a new problem domain, how many people here have been scared away from Haskell? Okay. Um, when, you, when you're confronted with a space that has a lot of new things to learn, what do you do? Do you start... Um, do you just dive into one area and just go deep? Um, we call that doing a PhD, right? <laughs> you, you pick a topic and you become the world expert on that topic. And if that's the wrong topic, well, 
sorry. Um, so, so depth first search might not be the best career move. Um, so you could, you, could go, you can go off and get lost in the weeds. On the other hand, we have like breadth first search. We could always just kind of walk the tree to a, to a given depth, keep track of all the next pointers, and then all you have to be able to do is remember all the things. The problem with that is we've already established that memory is a pretty fallible medium. So on the other hand, one of the things that we've, uh, uh, we've learned, uh, I used to do uh, chess programming, uh, and I had an uncle who was a, like a, 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 he was actually a chess grandmaster, and uh, was way, way better than I ever was. You know, I would sit in the kitchen and call out my moves, and he would just watch TV and call them back, and I tried to cheat and it never worked. Um, and uh, one of the things that you learn when, you, when you're trying to build like a chess AI or something like that is that it's better to actually um, deal with the fact that the user's going to be able to press, you need to be able to deal with the fact that the user's going to press the button at any point in time and you have to be able to give them a move. And if you're trying to run some perfect proof search out to 13 ply, 13 moves out, if you don't get a chance to finish, you still have to be able to give them a move. And if you don't explore that entire space, you're done. You just, you, you can't even give a coherent move. On the other hand, if what you do is you go one sort of, one ply out, you start, you do one move worth of exploration of the space, um, you have at least a bad move you can offer. And then you can go two ply out. You can go, you can just start over from scratch and go and reiterate through that space. And it's interesting to me that if you sit down and, and do the math on this, as long as there's like sort of more than one direction you can go, if every time you come back to a topic or an area and you go, you go a little bit deeper, the overhead of starting over from scratch and relearning a thing amortizes out to a constant factor. Okay? So don't be afraid to go back and relearn something that you've done. It's like, oh, I knew that. Well, why would I want to relearn it again? Because when you do that, you've gone back and enforced spaced repetition. You've gone back into the topic, you've refreshed those memories, you've made them stronger, you've ensured that it'll be around longer into your career. And as long as you go deeper, whenever you're learning something new, uh, what you've done is you've done a breadth first search. You've, you've picked up little tendrils into all these areas. And, uh, you know, while breadth first search is actually about keeping track of all those pointers. Here, what you're getting is by doing the iterative deepening, you're, uh, by, by going back to the topic, you're able to hold on to a little bit of that more of that information for a lot longer. So again, whenever you come back to a topic, go deeper. Uh, I, I uh, bounced off of a book on categories for the working mathematician like nine times before I finally made it through. Um, and this brings me to, uh, to a topic. I worked, um, in telecom, we, we started a phone company back in 1996. Uh, started with this man, uh, Lauren Olson. And he was a, a mathematician and an actuary and a bunch of stuff. And he had a, a thing that he said to me when I saved him three quarters of a million dollars one day, uh, on, like figuring out how to lay out equipment and some phone switches. And he, um, he said, well, you know, I'd rather hire a bunch of dumb mathematicians than one really smart one. And I didn't, I didn't, I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. Um, because I was pretty sure he just insulted me. <laughs> um, and so I, I steamed me up, and I, and I, and I sat around, and about a, about a couple weeks later, I finally like, ran to, into his office and, and cornered him. I said, okay, what the hell did you mean? Uh, and so what he was trying to get at was that I couldn't really explain how it was that the, the solution that I'd, I'd given him had arisen. Um, and so, when you're talking about, say, a bunch of dumb mathematicians, uh, he was um, trying to get at the point that if they're not that smart, they've had to learn how to decompose problems, right? Because they can't fit the problem in their head, right? The kid, the kid in, the kid in high school who could just do all the problems in his head, never showed his work, who was constantly being rated by the, berated by the teacher. How many people here were that person? I mean, I mean, I was, um, I never, I, I could just never be bothered to show my work. Um, 
that person has never really been confronted with a problem that they can't fit in their head. And so they, they just aren't equipped with the machinery to peel off the pieces that they need to solve. And when you're confronted with a problem that's too big, now all of a sudden it's just, oh, that's too hard, that's just out of scope, I don't, I don't, I don't care about that right now. And it, it's something that gets put off and pushed away. And so when I got the chance to go back, um, I got the chance to go back to college and, and uh, I did my math degree, I did a computer science degree and uh, collected a few other things. Um, Lauren's words really stuck with me and I, and I tried to make sure that when I did it that I was willing to sit down and do all the stupid drill. And it was tedious and boring. But the thing is, by the end of it, I didn't lose it. Because I'd been sitting there, starting from scratch, doing things over and over again, repeatedly. Getting this, the benefits of the spaced repetition and the continuous drill and whatnot. You know. uh, and the benefit, I think, of Lauren's approach is that it can be taught. And this brings me to, the, to, a, to another notion. Um, and so now I'm going to start rambling about, about a bunch of um, old white male mathematicians. Um, so we've, you know, functional programming seems to be becoming a thing. Um, but we, we have to be careful about this sort of phenomenon of uh, just lapsing into jargon. Uh, and to that point, I want to I uh, talk a bit about, I think Martin and Todd did a, a bit the other day about how uh, functional programmers, uh, you know, the, I can't hear you over the sound of how inferior you are. Um, the purpose of abstraction isn't to make up a name and to terrify people who don't know that name. The, the purpose of an abstraction is to, is to make a level, a tool that we can, we can talk about with, sort of abstra with absolute precision. It's a, it, it gives us a building block, something that we can stand on top of and go a little bit higher. And if you're going to use jargon, always be willing to break it down. You really have to be willing to break it down because otherwise all you're doing is you're creating an in-culture of people who know what you're talking about and you're excluding everyone else. And, it, and it, can be, it can be fun to have in-jokes with your friends. It can, you know, monads or monoids in the category of endofunctors, what's the problem? But if you're not willing to break down what that means, all you're doing is creating you know, a class of haves and have-nots. You're, 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 you're locking people out uh, from your community. And again, the purpose of that abstraction was to be able to build things that you could build upon. It would be nice to have other people who can build on those things with us. Um, a reason why I use the right math word for things, you know, I, I, I call a monad a monad rather than a warm, fuzzy thing, is because it gives me access to 70 years worth of documentation, right? It's the exact opposite of trying to lock somebody out of a space. It's because I don't know what I don't know about a thing. But I do know that I can go look up 70 years worth of papers that people have written on this topic. How many things can you really point to in computer science that you use actively every day today that have that kind of legacy, that have been tested for that long? And, uh, but, it, but it really is important that if you're going to drop into these words, it, be willing to at least explain them to, to, your best, to the best of your understanding. And this, this applies to really to any sort of technical jargon. And I think that, you know, Mr. Garrison here would be really happy if we were better at uh, conveying information. Um, so to that point, you know, a, uh, a, an appropriate Knuth quote here was uh, him talking about the notion that uh, computer science isn't the art of geniuses, but it's really that all we're doing is trying to build on each other's works. And again, that sort of, that dense jargon that we have is us trying to figure out how to encapsulate and enclose a construct so that we can, we can build it up, put it down as a brick, and stand atop it and, and keep layering more stuff, on to, uh, stuff above us. So now I'm going to go um, try and talk about the same topic, uh, again, with random old white mathematicians. 
Um, so there was a, or is, a mathematician, uh, Jean-Pierre Serre. He's, he's still alive. Uh, he's still doing good stuff, too. Um, who was very active in the 60s. He's a French mathematician. And uh, he, was, he was famous for being able to sort of crack problems uh, very effectively. So he would take a problem and he'd do it like a walnut and get out just the right shape chisel and flay it open and get at whatever was inside, right? So you could write these little brilliant two-page papers that um, got right to the meat of the problem very quickly. And the, the problem with Sarah's approach is that it can't be taught. It's the same thing. It's Feynman's algorithm all over again, right? You have to have his sort of, his sort of clockwork mind to really understand his approach to problems. Uh, now, he had a contemporary, a fellow Alexander Grothendieck. Um, uh, Grothendieck actually uh, just passed away a couple weeks ago. Um, now, he, here he is wearing his sort of uh, Jedi master robes. Uh, he, he went a little bit uh, crazy later in his career and um, decided that uh, he wanted everyone to stop using his math and uh, uh, renounce citizenship in every country and ran off to the French Pyrenees and joined a monastery. Um, and then frantically tried to get the rest of the world to stop doing what he had told them to do. Um, but one of the things that he was, he was very good at early in his career um, was sort of synthesizing and taking apart constructs that other people had made. So he would take Sarah's beautiful two-page proofs and expand them out into thousands of pages of category theory. Uh, so he wrote... Um, the, the element uh, EGA. Uh, so if you think about this, in the, in, in the world of uh, mathematics, where almost nobody gets an attribution, right? Um, he's got two of them, three-letter acronyms that are uh, attributed to his name, right? Uh, you, you ask most mathematicians, they can tell you what those two things mean. And uh, he would take Sayre's short, brilliant little proofs and blow them out into thousands of pages of category theory, where every individual step followed more or less obviously from the previous step. And I think the real benefit of his approach is that it can be taught, right? Someone can pick up these books today and with a little bit of background, or a fair bit of background, but they can at least make it through the material and they can come out the other end able to understand what's going on. And again, to that point of, you know, mathematician who nobody gets their own attributions. Uh, oops, wrong, wrong slide. <laughs> uh, so his, his approach here was that instead of thinking of the, of the walnut as something that we're going to try and crack with a chisel, take it and throw it in a glass of water. And then let it soak. And every once in a while, reach into the glass, try it out, see if, you, if, it, gives, if it yields to finger pressure. If it's, if it's ready, it'll just pop open. You probably have a soggy walnut, but uh, you'll get to the meat. <laughs> And so, again, Grothendieck has a lot of stuff named after him in the, in the world of uh, mathematics. And really, he was only heavily active for about four years. Uh, he, um, his approach there gave us a vocabulary for talking about the problem domain. Okay? He, gave us, he gave us words. He gave us a name to call a thing. He gave us... You know, whole new worlds to explore and the very words that we use to describe them. And uh, one of the analogies he used to use was this thing called the, the rising sea. He got, he got kind of fed up with the walnut analogy. You know, the, I don't understand why. But uh, he used to, uh, and, and it was originally said in French, and uh, my French is terrible, so I'll steal somebody's translation. Um, um, the idea was that instead of thinking of the problem like a single walnut to be cracked, think of it more like you have a whole surface, a whole area of problems, like, a, with like some hard, rocky surface or something like that. And the, the vocabulary, the tools, the, the, the machinery, the, the mathematics that you have to, to, to approach the problem, the terminology, the jargon, what have you, um, starts out pretty far away. You, know, you, you don't see quite how it's going to solve this space. But if you, keep, if you can keep building up and, and, and sort of letting it swell over time, then eventually it'll just cover, cover the surface, the whole area. If you, if you were to think about this more, more like the, in the walnut analogy, if you were to scatter a bunch of walnuts you know, on the beach, 
eventually the tide's going to come in and cover them all up, and they're all going to be soaking at the same time. You may have a hard time finding your walnuts, but uh, you can at least um, get them cracked or get them open. Um, and, uh, you know, I do a lot of work in uh, the Haskell community trying to build up vocabulary. So, uh, Growth and Dick is the kind of mathematician I aspire to be. I'm really not that kind of person. I'm, I'm the guy who takes the chainsaw out of the walnut and is really happy if he can get anything out of it. Um, and um, with the lens library that we have in Haskell, uh, a lot of it is about if we take that notion of field member access and those kind of things, um, there's lots of related notions that we can start to build up that fill out the surrounding space. And we can motivate a lot of those things by sort of wandering around in category theory and looking around for something that exists for a fundamental reason. Um, it's perhaps not the best example of library design because it exposes a lot of its details in its, in its surface, uh, a lot of the internals of like how all these category theory constructs fit together. Um, but it is interesting because in, to me in some sense because it, it's offered a lot of people a way to start approaching some of these more inaccessible areas of, of math. They can, they can see, they can figure out what a, what a profuncter is or something kind of scary that's a little bit off, way off in, in left field. Um, but which exists for canonical reasons. And then tie those things back to the sort of common sense intuitions of what a getter and a setter should be able to do. I should be able to put something in and get it back out, and if I get, if I put something in, when I get what I get out should be what I put in, and vice versa. Um, they're all the common sense, if I put something in twice, I should get, and I get something out. It should be the same as if I put in once, or the put in the second thing, just once. And, um, and so with, 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 with lenses, the, the main thing that I was trying to do was build up a compositional vocabulary, a, a vocabulary for how I go in and I drill into, into types and data um, records and maps and all the things that I have lying around, and another vocabulary for what it is I want to do with all the things that I go find. And if we play around with the sort of spaced repetition meme, uh, I don't use these flashcard applications or what have you. There's, all, there's a, I can't even remember the, the nice one that, that, that folks like to use for spaced repetition. But what I do you do is I maintain a lot of libraries. Um, and I write, them, I write them in Haskell because they seem to compose pretty well. And uh, I find that by maintaining a lot of different things, what I get is I get bug reports. And bug reports, hopefully if I'm doing my job, are coming in less frequently or, well, if I'm not doing my job, uh, they're not, or if I'm getting too many users, they're not. But <laughs> um, the idea here is that if, 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 my, if my bugs, the severity of my bugs, I'm, I'm having severe bugs less frequently, then when I go back to revisit something to, to solve one of those bugs, I just go back, relearn whatever the domain it was that I built a library for if I have to from scratch, and then make sure I go deep enough that I can squash this class of bugs dead. And uh, I, I confess that this works particularly well for me because I, you know, I have a, a large number of collaborators who are very, very good at, at fixing up all my stupid mistakes really quickly, um, as long as I can get something out there to start. But the, the idea here that if you, if you build something, and as long as you're willing to continue maintaining it, you can't forget it. Um, now, there's, there's perhaps a, uh, you know, the... The, the Greek myth about the, the, the guy who would raise the ox over his shoulders every day and then, you know, started with a, with a, with a young foal or something, a young baby ox, I don't know what the right word is, and then would, would, you know, try and raise it over his shoulders every day and eventually, you know, he became strong enough to lift an ox. Well, the, the, you know, of course, the problem is eventually you, 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 you break. Uh, but, <laughs> but until then, uh, this seems to work pretty well. Um, Well, uh, so that brings me to one last uh, central point, I think, which is that it becomes very important to know when to walk away from a project, you know, before the ox breaks your back. And uh, to that, I want to talk about one, one last um, old white male mathematician. Um, 
uh, Saunders McLean was a really smart guy. He, um, he had the highest academic standing in the history of Yale. He, 328 points or something like that, uh, whatever. And uh, then he went on to go do his PhD. He went to Germany, uh, to, to a university in Göttingen. And at uh, Göttingen, he decided he was going to focus on mathematical logic. He tackled a, um, the idea of, well, what today we would call automated theorem proving uh, in 1932. Um, they didn't really have computers to run it on and nobody there valued anything he was doing in that space. And um, so he all but failed out of his degree. He managed to, he managed to pass with the lowest possible mark um, after his ridiculous standing at Yale. It was kind of a, kind of a blow to him. And he had, um, now, he was at, he, now he was in Germany, like right during the rise of Nazi Germany. Um, you know, the, there was all of this uh, sort of um, there, were, there were a number of very famous mathematicians who were at Göttingen with him. Uh, Emmy Noether, um, she gave us uh, rings and, and most, a good chunk of um, abstract algebra and gave the physicists a, a great way to think about invariance and all sorts of other crazy things in her career. Um, had really sort of helped bring uh, the notion of algebra to the college there, or, or to, to what we would think of as modern algebra. And he went on and he wrote, he wrote some wonderful books on abstract algebra. Um, and founded this whole notion of category theory with Samuel Eilenberg. He, he basically he went back to the States and he said, well, I'm going to double down on logic. And he gave another talk on logic and it was like roundly rejected. And he very nearly got completely run out of academia. And then he switched to teaching the, the kind of logic that, uh, that Emmy Noether had uh, sort of brought into Germany uh, before. She, well, the Nazis turned around and uh, ran her out of uh, Göttingen, and she died a couple of years later, actually. Um, but it's really important to know, to be willing to walk away from a problem. Had he not walked away from that, that sort of rat's nest worth of, like, playing around with their improving, we never would have gotten category theory. We wouldn't have anything. He probably wouldn't have a career. Um, but, but it's important not to just walk away because, well, there's, there's, there's funny cat pictures on the Internet or because the problem's hard. It's really because, walk away when it's not productive, but not, when it, not just because it's hard, and not just because you're distracted or what have you. Um, click. All right. Um, now, there's, there's, there, there are some hazards here. I'm, uh, I, I, I so wish this wasn't me. Um, we, we all have you know, millions of little projects lying around or whatever it is that we have. And what, one of the things that I do try to do at least is to put these things up online, right? To, get to, to, to make them visible so that people can see that I do, you know, everybody has a million little irons in the fire. It's not just the, the completed projects that we have. Um, you know, we all have things that we would rather be doing or things that, you know, that, you know, that we, we feel passionate about that, yeah, I'll get around to that, you know? Um, I have a whole distributed database project. I, yeah, a bunch of other random things. So to that end, in summary, I think one key point is that uh, bad tools and just not knowing what you don't know, there's sort of this no Rumsfeldian notion of the unknown unknowns, right? Um, not knowing a thing is really expensive. <laughs> um, and if you can keep multiple pet problems and solutions around, um, you can often pair them up which will at least help mitigate that point. Um, I really think it's a good idea to try and explore this notion of space repetition. Your career is going to be a lot longer than you think. Um, uh, whenever you come back to something, go deeper, because it, and it, this is what we've done is we've enabled you, to, or you, you've enabled yourself to be able to give an answer with the to the best of your knowledge with what you know. But by going deeper, you can continue to advance. And um, try to build the right vocabulary for your domain. Having words for a thing is really important. You know, there's a, there's a sadly somewhat rebu uh, re uh, debunked notion in the, the, the field of linguistics of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, that the language that you think in shapes the thoughts you can think. 
And while it may have been largely rejected in the linguistics community, I think in the, in the programming setting, it's a, it's, or in the, in the mathematics setting, I think it, has a lot of, it carries a lot of weight. Um, but, but you have to be really careful with jargon because any sort of terminology is, can be used for exclusion. And if you use a term, you always have to be willing to break it down. Um, you know, I, I try to do documentation. I'm very bad at it. I do, on the other hand, sit on IRC and talk to people pretty much 24 hours a day. I've largely given up sleep. <laughs> um, but don't be afraid to walk away from unproductive paths. Um, you know, just because, because otherwise that, that path is just acting as a denial of service attack on your brain. And so, the final note is just don't walk away just because something's hard. Thank you.